Hello, and welcome to lecture 18 on sentiment analysis. So I'm going to start off uh, with an introduction that explain roughly what sentiment analysis is and some of the many applications of sentiment analysis. Then I'm going to go into uh, how, you know, some of the challenges with doing sentiment analysis. So sentiment analysis is very roughly measuring people's, how people feel about things or their emotional reactions to things. And so there's various issues with the measurement of sentiment analysis, which I'll discuss uh, in this section here. Then I'm going to show you how you can use uh, Amazon Web Service um, to, to sort of handle some of those issues and do the sentiment analysis for you. And in the last part of this talk, I'm going to go into uh, the data processing workflows. Um, so I'm going to suggest some ways in which you can hook together you know, the different Amazon Web Services and Lambda functions and so on to do the data processing in the cloud for sentiment analysis for the machine learning prediction stuff and also to handle the, you know, communication with the client via WebSockets, which obviously I'm going to cover in the next lecture. So some suggestions there about how you can put it all together in the last section of this talk. Okay, so sentiment um, is roughly uh, what people feel about something. So, you know, they might have some opinions about something, that something's good, something's bad. People have uh, emotional reactions to things. So, you know, very strong emotional reactions to President Trump, for example. So if we're talking positive sentiments, uh, we might say that company V made a technological breakthrough. Product W is great. Product X made my hair look amazing. Company Y is a good place to work. And I enjoy staying at Hotel Z, for example. These are examples of texts that have expressed positive sentiments about the, you know, V, W, uh, X, Y, and Z. And on the other hand, you have negative sentiments, right? We have company N had a third bad quarter. Um, product O is disgusting, P is an evil person, I hate working for company Q, and Ho Hotel R had a terrible service. So here we have negative emotions or negative sentiments being associated with the products and companies and so on, N, O, P, Q, and R. Now sentiment matters um, because there's a very close link between uh, how we feel about something and the decisions we make um, in relation to that thing, yeah? So if I've got positive feelings about a product or a hotel or whatever, then I'm going to likely to buy that product, go to that hotel and so on and so forth. Um, and so in terms of decision making, um, emotions are an absolutely critical role. And we use our feelings to make decisions. So, you know, there's sort of various schools of thought that think, that, you know, decisions are all rational, that we do some kind of first order logic in our head. You yeah, know, but really that's nonsense, yeah? We kind of see the world. We sort of have all these perceptions and then we have our emotional reactions to what we see and those emotional reactions drive, you know, what we do and the decisions about, you know, that we make about our lives and about, you know, how we interact with the world. And so, you know, to pick, you know, one of the many bits of scientific research on this, um, you can show that if you manipulate people's emotional state, um, for example, by making, uh, putting, a, uh, exposing to a bad smell, then you can also change their moral judgments. So, you know, how people will jump, make, judge things when you ask them questions for a questionnaire will be influenced by you know their emotional state by what they're smelling and i remember you know possibly uh anecdotal stories about you know being able to sell more cars if you give people comfy seats to sit on when you're giving them the pitch because again you're putting their body into a positive emotional state um, when you're trying to sell them the car and there's there's a you know ton of research and all this kind of stuff so here's a couple of books um that you know uh are sort of quite aligned with the sort of position that I, that I take on all this. And all this kind of hooks up to some extent with my research as well. This is partly the reason, interest, the reason I'm interested in this. So, you know, I built AI models that incorporate sentiment, um, incorporate uh, emotions, and there's a ton of work on that. So if you want to build systems that think uh, like humans, they're probably going to have to use emotions to make their decisions at some level in the architecture somewhere, yeah? Um, they're not going to be just pure rational systems or, you know, whatever that is. So anyway, so we've got a couple of books here. Um, on left, we've got Descartes' Error. I think it's 1995. So it's a really brilliant book by Damasio that's had a big influence on my thinking about all this. So he has a sort of interpretation of the brain decision-making based on this idea of uh, what he calls somatic markers. So when I look at stuff in the world, um, that puts my body into certain kinds of states through, you know, learning or, you know, some hardwired stuff. And then I perceive those states in my body. Yeah? So suppose I've got a fear of snakes. Yeah? So I look at a snake, my body will generate a fear reaction, and then I perceive that fear reaction in my body, and that will influence 
And then when I think about, you know, whether I want to go near the snake or away from the snake, I think about different scenarios, and it, these scenarios will evoke different emotional reactions in me, um, and then I make my decision based upon those emotional reactions. So that's roughly uh, Damasio's picture. And he sort of then demonstrates by looking at some brain damaged patients that if you if you disrupt this uh, emotional decision making mechanisms, you know, there's a Phineas Gage, I think he had a big pipe, you know, metal bar stuck through his head and broke all of that stuff. Then then it leads to bad decision making. You can't make good decisions um, without your emotions in play. And then more recently, I've just been listening to uh, The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. So he's broadly aligned with Damasio. Um, he has this sort of metaphor of the rider, the sort of rational person riding, the rider uh, riding this elephant. Yeah? And the elephants are emotional systems and the riders are sort of sitting on top. And so again, he argues that most of our decisions are sort of, you know, they're sort of rapid emotional judgments about things that we, and that's how we make our decisions. And then rationality maybe can influence those decisions a little bit, maybe influence those decisions in others a little bit. But largely, the rationality is playing the role of explaining and justifying those decisions within a social context. So I don't agree with everything Hayek says, but his emphasis on emotions and decision-making and the rapid emotional responses to things being a key part of decision-making, um, I, I roughly agree with him in, in the book on the right now. So, scientific evidence, I think, fairly conclusively shows that there's a close connection between sentiment or emotion and our behavior. So what companies want to do, obviously, um, is to be able to predict behavior and manipulate behavior so we buy products and all that kind of stuff. So if we can measure sentiment, then we can predict behavior and maybe we can influence it as well. And so people use AI and a bunch of other tools to measure the sentiment that's expressed about something in news articles, reviews, social media updates, and so on and so forth. And this is sometimes referred to as opinion mining. And there's two sort of, this is a bit of slightly subtle distinction here, but um, most of opinion mining is trying to figure out um, whether people are positive, have positive opinions about a product, a service, a politician, so on and so forth. Um, so that's their emotional reaction to something, yeah? But you can also measure the general emotional tone of a text, you know. If you read a text, is it kind of a happy text written by a happy person? Is it sad and so on and so forth? So might have a bit of text that's sort of deeply melancholy. Um, it wouldn't tell you that the person is sad because they stayed at a hotel Y or whatever. It's just saying that the general tone of that text is, is melancholy and sad or whatever. Now, something that's kind of quite tightly tied into sentiment analysis, um, but not, there's not a necessary connection because you could do psychographics without sentiment, just manually without, you know, the AI dimension. But there's a increasingly tight connection between sentiment analysis and psychographics. So the idea of psychographics is we build up a sort of uh, emotion, sort of model of someone's personality effectively, their emotions, their values, their interests and their attitudes, how they're likely to react to different things in the world. And the sentiment analysis, the AI driven sentiment analysis is often used in conjunction with other tools um, to build up psychographical profiles. So, you know, a sort of picture of, you know, your personality, you know, in a, in a bunch of numbers, yeah? And as I'll discuss later, um, psychographics enables us to personalize marketing messages for people who have different psychographical profiles. So if you're, you know, a sort of a tendency towards melancholy, let's say, um, you know, you might be triggered to buy something um, if you're shown promotional messages based upon some fantasy of happiness, right? Maybe you're depressed and don't want to be depressed. So if you see things that are happy, maybe you'll buy the product that you think will make you happy, yeah? Well, if another person, you know, might be more, you know, in the sort of angry camp, let's say, or, you know, more, you know, more stressed or whatever. So in their case, if someone's this pick the stressed person, it'll always, you know, generate a lot of anxiety, let's say, then we might be better able to reach that person in terms of getting them to buy a product if we can target something based on relax, relaxation or spirituality or something like that, yeah? So by analyzing people's personalities and then delivering individualized, personalized messages to those people, we can potentially sell more products. So that's the sort of application of psychographics. And I'll talk about the Cambridge Analytical, Cambridge Analytical's use of that in a little bit. So this is the kind of uh, personality insights sort of uh, fancy visualization thing you can get um, through IBM. So they'll give you, you know, your level of modesty, your cooperation, your altruism, all the rest of it, yeah. So, you know, if you've got some massive altruism, you know, maybe you're a sucker for charity ads or something like that. Um, as if you're, 
you know, low on hedonism, you know, they're probably gonna, probably not going to waste your time uh, trying to sell them, you know, some kind of clubbing in Ibiza experience, yeah? So based upon the uh, uh, sort of a generated psychographical profile like this, um, we can target our marketing messages and, you know, potentially change people's behavior in, in, a, in a more fine-grained way than just providing a single TV advert that applies to the entire country, let's say. So here's a few um, applications. So I'm not trying to get you motivated with all this kind of stuff, right? So we've got stock trading, <coughs> marketing, politics, call centers, relationships, art, you name it. Um, if it involves human behavior and decision making, um, there's probably an application of sentiment analysis somewhere. So in the context of uh, you know, many of your projects this term, um, the st uh, sentiment analysis you know, has some obvious applications uh, with stock trading, yeah? So people's opinions are linked to the rise and fall of stock, of stock prices. So for example, if there's good news about a company in the Financial Times or something, um, then people will typically you know, rush off and buy stocks to some extent, yeah? Or people will recommend that people buy stocks, which ends up in being the same thing, yeah? So there might be a news article about a company discovering a new mineral deposit, um, you know, gold prospecting company suddenly has a big break and finds all this gold. Um, that's obviously good news. It's likely then that the company's value will increase over time, and therefore people will buy stocks in that company, and therefore the stock company, will, the price, stock prices will go up. But this, um, that's so. This example here is a real, uh, a real bit of news uh, causing a stock to increase in value. But it's also the case that if you have some completely nonsensical, you have some fake news or unreal news, um, that can still motivate people to buy stocks, right? So if people read a bunch of news. Um, that even if it turns out to be false in a week, if it's if people believe it's true, then they're going to buy stocks and drive the price of stocks in the company up, even though the, the sort of stock, you know, curve will look, you know, go up a bit and then it'll go back down again when people realize the news is rubbish. You can still make money from that if you people if you know that people will uh, are hearing some news and you think that they're believing that news, even if that news is not true. So, you know, fake news is potentially, you know, damaging in a real sense. Yeah. Um, and the reverse is obviously true as well. If people hear bad news about a company, they're more likely to sell the stocks, the stock prices are more likely to go down and so forth. So if you can monitor the news, you can predict the changes in stock price and therefore make money from the changes in stock price. <coughs> so here, for example, we've got a company that you know provides exactly that kind of information for that purpose. We've got like Sentiment Trader. Um, so here we've got, you know, the, you know, fluctuations in the sentiment associated with whatever this product, with this, whatever this stock is, and then you've got the actual price as well, and then you can pay for, you know, these kinds of reports, you know, that uh, you know, give you these different sentiments about the different companies and how it's changing over time. And I'll bet you um, that any serious hedge fund or, you know, stock trading company will be hoovering up this information, uh, sentiment information, you know, from all over the world, either directly or paying a company to hoover it up for them, and then they'll be feeding that sentiment data into their uh, trading algorithms, yeah? So the trading algorithms will be influenced by, you know, machine learning, all that kind of stuff, but they'll also be influenced by, you know, sentiment analysis of news in a, you know, in a high-tech and fine-grained way, probably. <coughs> so a huge application of all the sentiment analysis is within marketing, yeah? When you're doing, trying to sell something to people, you need to know what, how people feel about that particular product. And you've got this kind of focus group stuff. But these days, you know, with these big data tools, we can hoover up enormous amounts of data from social media and actually measure um, what people feel about a particular product, yeah? Because people with positive feelings about a product are obviously gonna, you know, uh, purchase and recommend it. Uh, people with negative feelings about products are gonna not buy it and not recommend it. And so a lot of the advertising you know, it's designed to produce positive emotional reactions to products so that they buy or recommend it, right? So pick an example, um, so I, you know, consider the recent uh, uh, Lloyd's TSB adverts, at least what I remember of them. You know, mostly the adverts are not telling you that Lloyd's Bank, you know, has any kind of anything special in terms of its products and services. Most of the advert is taken up with these slow motion pictures of horses running along beaches and so on and so forth with long flowing hair or a little bit of the retrospective stuff with the old, you know, shy horses trotting about doing old shy horsey stuff, yeah? So the, the myth, so what the advert's doing is it's not telling you some rational facts about, you know, how Lloyd's Bank is, you know, superior, you know, by 3% in these various metrics or whatever. It's, it's trying to produce this positive emotional reaction in you and to associate that positive emotional reaction with, um, with the Lloyd's Bank itself, yeah? So that, 
you know, by showing the horses, we all love horses, right? So we all get that positive little cozy glow when we feel, look at pictures of horses. And then that little cozy glow gets associated with the, the Lloyds Bank logo or whatever. So when I walk down the high street and I see Lloyds Bank, I get a more positive emotional reaction to the sign of that Lloyds logo than I would without the advertising. And then maybe I'll, you know, use some of the services that are actually identical to everybody else's services, yeah? So that's the, and obviously we want, companies want to produce that kind of emotional reaction in us and so they want to measure how effectively they're doing that and they do that with sentiment analysis. So companies analyze social media, reviews, etc. to see how people's sentiment is changing in response to promotions and advertising campaigns. And obviously if you're trying to uh, sell, sell uh, candidates uh, for office in politics um, then sentiment analysis matters too, right? Because people vote for candidates that they have the most positive feelings about. So again, we want to use sentiment analysis to measure people's current feelings about the candidate and how they've responded to campaigns. And of course, you can do a sort of fine-grained sort of thing here. Uh, we can randomly select half of the people for one campaign and half of the people for the other campaign. You measure the sentiment in those two groups of people, and then you can see which campaign was more effective, and then you can roll it out more generally and this kind of stuff, yeah? So this is all about the sort of fine-tuning of the candidate and the campaign to maximize positive, positive sentiment. And obviously, it can also be very useful if you want to, you know, do some proper analysis of the constituency you're trying to get elected to, right? So, pick an example. Let's suppose uh, we did some hoovered up all the stuff we possibly could. So, suppose we want to be elected in Leeds as the MP, yeah? So, what we could do is we could hoover up every single little bit of social media and news and whatever uh, from Leeds. And then we could do what's called aspect sentiment analysis, which we'll talk about a little bit later, to find out about which of the issues do people care most about. And let's suppose we find 75% of the people in Leeds care passionately about the new car park, you know, and they really, they love, they, they hate the new car park, or the plans for the new car park, let's say. 75% of people hate the plans for the new car park in Leeds, and we find all that with some algorithmic, you know, machine learning sentiment stuff. So then... With that information, the candidate can then say, well, hey, you know, I've identified these particular issues and, uh, that I can promise to fix. And then they can try to get elected on the basis of fixing those issues. And then they found those issues, though, through this process of largely automated process of analysis, machine learning, and so on and so forth. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff you can do with politics and sentiment analysis. And has been done, you know, in our, in our own times recently, right? So the rather notorious uh, Cambridge Analytica was using all this kind of stuff, yeah? So roughly what they did, I mean, I'm not an expert in it, but as far as I understand, this is roughly what they did. They had access to Facebook data of 100 million US voters. So that's a big data set, right? Huge data set. And then what they did is they uh, built up uh, the psychographical profiles of all of these 100 million US voters. Yeah, so they, they know exactly, you know, as far as you can from the data available, what each of these 100 million people sort of think and feel about different issues. Yeah, this psychographical profile. And these and the personality types as well. Are they anxious? Are they happy, sad, you know, right wing, left wing, all that kind of stuff would go into the psychographical profile. Then they div then they sort of split the psychographical profiles into a broad set of categories, maybe ten, something like that. And then they developed ads targeted at the different personality types. And because they're working within the Facebook environment, they can display the appropriate ad to individualized ads to each person. They could develop a hundred million different ads, but that'd be kind of take a lot of time. So instead they developed maybe 10 and showed those 10 adverts, you know, in a targeted way to the people who were most likely to respond to them. Yeah. So it's a sort of nice use of the sort of social stuff, building up a profile of someone and then displaying an advert targeted to that individual person. Yeah. So all of this seems kind of dark, right? Um, but the technology itself is not illegal, right? It's not illegal to build a pro personal uh, psychographical profile of someone and then target an ad specifically to that person using whatever social media tools or customized advertising or you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, we're seeing that kind of stuff all the time, right? Um, the, the reason Cambridge Analytica is slightly notorious um, is partly because people think that, that you know they're probably funded by the Russians, um, so or well, the campaign at least was funded by the Russians, and therefore it was like the interference in uh, of one country in another country's elections, which is dubious, right? And also, um, the data that they were using was obtained without consent. So a lot of this kicked back and affected Facebook's reputation because they just sort of handed all this data over to Cambridge Analytica without presumably the knowledge or consent of the users. So that you know, those are the issues. Not the the issue is not really, although people hate this stuff, right? And I understand why, but um, 
you know, this is the modern reality of marketing that this building up of profiles and the targeting of customized adverts, that's how it is now, right? So that's, that's legal and that's not gonna go away. We can also imagine applications in call centers. In fact, there are applications already. Um, so call centers, people, often quite angry people, are calling up to try and sort out problems and they're even more annoyed because they've waited 20 minutes listening to terrible music. Um, so one way you can use sentiment analysis in call centers is to monitor the customer satisfaction and how, how, how well they're responding to the help that's been given to them. And you can also see whether your employees are handling effectively with this. Is, uh, is there a single employee you know, who's generating consistently generates uh, negative sentiment in the in the people calling up, right? Can we pick out, can we identify the employees who are not very good at their job and, you know, give them more training or, you know, sack them or whatever, yeah? Um, and so if we look at Utopia AI, you might say it's more like Dystopia AI, um, then we've got, you know, they'll do exactly this stuff, right? They'll monitor, I think, and probably do uh, speech natural language to text conversion and then, they'll you know, analyze it all and then presumably you could profile individual employees and see how well they're doing and all this kind of stuff, yeah? One can also imagine, right, this is, uh, as far as I'm aware, no one's built this kind of stuff yet, but it's perfectly plausible given the technology I'm describing here. Uh, if you're in a relationship with someone, then you might say, well, let's take a more high-tech approach, right? Why not to use the sentiment analysis stuff to monitor your partner's uh, social media updates, text, emails, speech, etc. You know, hoover up all the data from your partner with her, his or her consent, of course, and then see if in general they've got positive or negative sentiment, then, you know, when they're coming back, you know, from a bad day at work, let's say, you'll be ready, you know, with the candles and, you know, bowl of hot soup and all that. Um, or, you know, if they're in a positive, if you know that they're in a positive frame of mind, then, you know, you can, you know, have that difficult conversation. Um, and obviously, you can also uh, do aspect sentiment analysis to pick out the different aspects of yourself or your, you know, your life together um, that your partner's not happy with, right? By doing your aspect sentiment analysis and looking at the results, you might find that your partner's deeply dissatisfied with your latest couch. And then you can, you know, have a conversation and get a better couch and have a better relationship, right? So although, you know, people might have doubts about this, you can see that, you know, potentially if, if it was embraced by both parties, um, it could lead to, you know, more communication and a better relationship. And in relationship counseling as well, right? You could pull up the two partners who are trying to get back together, you know, the, the, you could pull up the psychographical profiles of the partners and then, you know, do some proper analysis about how they could, what needs to be adjusted so that they can fit back together again, yeah? And probably something I'll, I'll uh, somewhat whimsically put forward as a student project um, next year will be like an app that displays this information in real time, yeah? It'd be kind of a fun project to do, right? Something that might be, you know, probably appear in Black Mirror at some point, yeah? And then there's, you know, I'm sure much more than this, but this is the example I know. Um, people build art stuff based on sentiment analysis. So this is a, a big data exhibition at um, Somerset House I went to a while ago. So you could, uh, they hoovered up all the Twitter data from London and split it down by boroughs. So you could see which was the, the sentiment of the different boroughs and which, were, which of the London boroughs was happier than others or sadder than others and all this kind of stuff. And you had this kind of interactive display to see that, yeah. And I'm sure you can imagine lots of other art projects, you know, based on sentiment analysis. And there's lots of other applications. Anything, as I said, that involves human decision-making, you know, you can probably get more insight into it by applying sentiment analysis. So, you know, what I would expect of a modern vice chancellor um, would be that they'd have a display on their desk, right? Showing them the, the sentiment of, you know, all the students and all the, you know, people's uh, other sort of key bodies uh, opinions of the university, right, displayed in some kind of real-time graphs and all that. I, I doubt whether Tim Blackman has all that data on Middlesex, but he should, right? He should be looking at how, you know, the, the perception and people's opinions both within and from outside of Middlesex is changing over time so they can make it better. Um, in a company, the same, you'd expect a chair of the chair of the board or whatever to have a picture of how their employees feel about the company, not just with some silly survey that, you know, like real-time Twitter stuff. Um, and obviously Theresa May, right, should have a real-time display of the citizens under her care and how their sentiments changing over time, yeah? And you can obviously do some more academic stuff with all this. You can do historical ch studies of changes in happiness over time, so digital humanities kind of thing, cross-cultural studies of happiness. And you can also see, well, psychotherapy, you know, if we could uh, measure someone's, uh, if, we could, if you can see that psychographical profiles where you're measuring sentiment and using and, bu and, build, and building up these models based on their sentiment analysis, you can then see how that's changing over time. And you can also see, throw in another recent example, um, if you want to see whether people are at risk of suicide, for example, you know, again, sentiment analysis might be able to help you to do that. So 
Um, I hope um, that I've convinced you there's an enormous amount of uh, benefit to be able to do, do some sentiment analysis. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool technology. And like any technology, there's the good stuff, right? You know, the happy relationship, you know. Um, uh, yeah, maybe it's not that much good stuff. Maybe it's a bit, bit of good stuff anyway. Um, but then obviously there's the, the dark side, right? You know, the Russians paying Cambridge Analytica allegedly um, to manipulate voters and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, good and bad, yeah? So, next section anyway, we're going to cover how we actually do it. So a sort of simple and obvious way in which you could do the sentiment analysis um, would be to just generate a list of positive words, you know, good, happy, cheerful, you know, whatever, tasty, um, and then a bunch of negative words, you know, sad, rubbish, awful, all that kind of stuff. And then we just count the number of occurrences in the text um, to, to, to measure the balance between positive and negative words in the text. <clears throat> and, you know, you occasionally read, you know, lots of people have done this, uh, probably in the early stages of all this, and you can get semi-useful results that might be above chance, you know, and, and that will give you an edge, right? If you're trying to do marketing, even, you know, 10% above chance gives you an edge, but um, uh, it's still going to get sentiment wrong in many cases because it's, you know, and I'll try to explain why that is, yeah? So the simple approach doesn't really work, um, or it doesn't work very effectively, um, because of things like grammatical structure, metaphor, context, and you know, I'm not an expert in this, so there's probably a bunch of other stuff that makes it kind of complicated. But just to show you, what I want to show you here is that it's, uh, it's, it's a non-trivial problem, and therefore uh, that the right approach to trying to do sentiment analysis, unless you're a PhD, you know, doing a PhD in this area, or unless you're a massive company, is to use uh, another a service provided by another company to do it for you. Because someone else, who is, you need to spend a lot of time to solve these problems, yeah? So let's look at some of, the, some of the challenges. I want you to develop an intuition that sentiment analysis is not easy, and that's what, that's what we're heading for here, yeah? So let's consider this sentence, right? At first I thought that the service was terrible, but then they sorted it out, and after that it was fantastic. So if we did a, a sort of raw keyword count, right? We might find the word terrible, so that's like a minus one or whatever. We might find fantastic, plus one. And so we might conclude that that was actually um, a sort of neutral, you know, some positive and some negative, yeah? But that's not really, um, as a human person, as a human reading this, that's not the picture I get. The picture, what really matters in this sentence is an evolution in the service over time, yeah? It starts off terrible, and now it's fantastic. So in terms of whether I want to use that company or service or whatever it is, um, my decision should really be based on its current state, not on the historical evolution of that state over time, which is less relevant, yeah? Because someone coming to it now, presumably, if, if this is accurate, um, would just have fantastic service, yeah? So a raw keyword count is not going to be able to untangle the, the evolution of that service over time, and even, you know, probably more, more contemporary approaches, probably AWS Comprehend is probably not going to manage that, I suspect. Um, because you need to understand time and how things change over time in order to pick out the, the current sentiment um, that's being expressed in that sentence. And so here's another sentence um, that I got off some example somewhere. Um, so the phone was well packaged, but I had to wait a whole week for, deliver for delivery. So here we need to understand grammatical structure because firstly we need to understand that this, this sentence says absolutely nothing about the phone. So even if we thought that well packaged was a positive sentiment, which itself is complicated, um, it's only saying that it was wrapped up well, it's, the phone itself could be useless, but if we did some kind of crude sentiment analysis, it could be, you know, then we might think that the, the, the phone was being talked about instead of the packaging of the phone. <coughs> the second reason this is a problem is because um, there's something in this sentence that's negative, obviously negative for humans, um, but isn't expressed as a, as a negative keyword or something like that, yeah? We're just saying that I had to wait a whole week for delivery. So, as a human, we know that waiting a whole week for delivery, actually, not that bad, right? But supposing that was bad, so it was a whole year for delivery. Um, as a human, we know that's bad. Um, but it's, we only know that because we know what it's like to wait for a week for something when we expected it to come earlier and all that. So, again, for a computer needs to understand what's going on in order to... Um, figure out, firstly, it's not about the phone, it's about the packaging and delivery, and secondly, that waiting a whole week for delivery is a bad sentiment, yeah? And we also get um, this problem that a, a, a collection of sentences, or even a single sentence, um, will contain multiple 
uh, sentiments about multiple things. Yeah, so let's let's consider this. Suppose this was a review here, saying I like this hotel, the service was excellent, but the food was mediocre. Yeah, so we got three subjects or three objects in this case. Sorry, three objects in the sentence. Right, we got the hotel, the service and the food, right? And we got separate sentiment being expressed about each. The hotel, slightly above positive, slightly positive. Service, highly positive. And the food, mediocre. So if this was a review on booking.com or something, and all we did was the global sentiment analysis, counting keywords, whatever it was, then we probably would end up with a, a sort of generally slightly positive uh, sentiment about the whole the hotel as a whole, if you like. But the people who are reading reviews care about different things. Some people care about being close to the town center. Some people care about the food because they love, you know, they uh, gourmands or whatever. Um, foodies, right? Um, whereas other people, you know, like to be pampered and with good service and all that and couldn't care less about the food. Um, so depending on what you want from the hotel, um, you have different sort of things you're looking for in the reviews, yeah? So you need to pick out the different, so subjects, sorry, objects of the sentences. Um, and the opinions that are being expressed about each, or it's kind of subject, topics, or whatever, yeah? So you're trying to pick out different aspects of the thing that's being discussed and the uh, the sentiment that's attached to those different aspects, yeah? That's why it's called aspect sentiment analysis. So, the, you know, this example kind of fits in nicely. I had a student doing a project last year, right, on aspect sentiment analysis. So he, he hoovered up tons and tons of reviews of hotels and tried to pick out the different... Uh, you know, aspects of those reviews, like the service and the, you know, cleanliness and all this kind of stuff. And then we got things like metaphor, which is a total nightmare for um, any kind of AI system. I think it's still a nightmare, yeah? Um, and you can only really, currently this kind of stuff's tackled by machine learning, but it's it's crude, yeah? So, say we got a sentence, the economy is stuck in the mud. So here, we, as humans interacting with the physical world, we understand what it is to be stuck in the mud. You've got your feet stuck in the mud, you know, in this gloopy stuff called mud, and then you can't move very fast and, you know, get anywhere, yeah? So with this kind of metaphor, you know, we can understand it instantly because we've got first-hand experiences of, you know, being stuck in the mud, right? Someone who didn't, you know, grew up in the desert or something might not know what mud is, so they wouldn't understand that, right? Um, it's only because you know what mud is, you have first-hand experience of mud, that you can then understand what being stuck in the mud is, and then you can translate that to another domain like the economy. And you can understand that being stuck in the mud, if an economy couldn't move and wasn't doing much because um, it was stuck, um, then maybe it's got low GDP or something like that, yeah? Oh, it's GDP is going down, low growth, right? Um, yeah, the low growth. Um, so probably computers would maybe interpret this literally, like the, you know, the economy is, you know, uh, you know, actually stuck in the mud, even though an economy is not the sort of thing that can be stuck in the mud. And they wouldn't interpret it negatively, right? Because being stuck in the mud, unless they know what being stuck in the mud is, they, they won't know that that's negative. So we're using metaphors kind of all the time and computers find it very hard to understand metaphors because they don't understand the physical world. So if I said my bicycle is like a tortoise, right? Um, then within our human culture, the thing we think about with tortoises is going slow, right? So if I said my bicycle is like a tortoise, most people would interpret that as my, I've got a slow bicycle. But, you know, it could equally mean, right, my bicycle is, looks like a tortoise. It has, you know, a shell and four legs and, you know, all that. You might also interpret it as my bicycle eats lettuce, right, um, just like a tortoise. Um, so this way in which we just so freely and easily use metaphors as humans is very hard for computers to understand. And that's, uh, you know, that, that's one of the reasons why sentiment analysis is challenging. Yeah. So, again, another example here, Computer X's bubble is about to burst. We know what it is for a, for a company to stretch itself beyond its feasible limits and overinvest and all this kind of stuff, or, you know, just be sort of blown up like a bubble. Um, but computers don't know anything about the physics of bubbles, so they can't really map what this as being a negative thing. It's just a bubble about to burst, right? It's just a, two meaningless objects it doesn't know anything about. Yeah? And then we got, you know, the sort of evolution of language over time. You know, t teenagers are notorious for invest inventing new, new vocabulary, right? So... And we've got the context in which the words are used, right? So this product is sick. Um, now that's, you know, here we've got, you know, some slightly old teenage slang, right? So we're saying that the product's actually really good, right? So if we were trying to figure out if teenagers really like this product, then this product is sick, would, should be associated with a positive sentiment result, yeah? Or I had a wicked time with my mates, yeah? But if I said the product made me sick, yeah? Then that would be a very different sentence and there'd be extremely negative sen sentiment, yeah? So sick and wicked are very different meanings depending who is using the words, like an older generation person would still think that was probably bad, yeah? 
Um, and there's issues about slang and generations and um, you know context. Yeah, so all this is super hard. So solving these problems really challenging. People really want to do good sentiment analysis, but it's really hard. People are publishing lots of research papers on sentiment analysis every year. And these days, um, of course, everything's based on kind of deep learning and big data. And that's how companies are uh, tackling, to some extent, the problem of sentiment analysis. Yeah, so I watched uh, IBM talk on this, uh, uh, like when I was preparing these lectures. And the guy there was uh, saying how they, I'll put, it, I'll put it in the link of resource actually, if you remember. So he was explaining how IBM are using Twitter data um, to train their system to do sentiment analysis. So Twitter data, um, the tweets, um, can come with a positive or negative emoji com, right? And then, I think I did this myself actually a few years ago. Um, and so you bung in the text into your deep net, whatever, and then you, and then you have a label, this positive or negative smiley face. And so you can then train your network to recognize texts that are positive um, and ones that are negative, yeah? And by hoovering up millions of these things, um, you can get a decent enough system that will be able to classify text as positive or negative sentiment. Won't do the aspect stuff, um, but it'll crudely do the positive and negative stuff. So because it's all so hard, because it's all based on uh, sentiment and big data, machine learning and so on, most people don't try and tackle it themselves because they know that if they just do keyword counts, they're going to do a bad job, yeah? So many companies have sort of sprung up that will do the sentiment analysis services for you. They'll, like, uh, they'll provide a, you know, if you've got a particular marketing objective, then they'll sort of do the sentiment analysis and provide the data back to you in some kind of spreadsheet or report or something. And if you want um, just uh, the actual, just the analysis done for you without getting in, you know, without some kind of, you know, service or anything, um, you can actually just use a web service. Um, there's plenty of those out there now, and you just chuck in your text to the web service and you get back the overall sentiment for that text, yeah? I don't know how good they are at ASMX sentiment analysis. So here's some example, uh, examples of companies. We've got like Crimson Hexagon, it does this AI pad, consumer insights, uh, talk walker, trends, customer opinions, all that kind of stuff, and Gavangi, whatever, sentiment analysis and opinion mining. So there's plenty of companies out there that, if you, that will hoover up the data for you, do the sentiment analysis on it, and then provide you what you need in a format, in the format that you need it. Yeah, and there's a bit of a longer list around there, yeah. On the other hand, if you want a more lightweight approach, um, you can use a web service to do the sentiment analysis for you, and then you can just manage the data yourself, and then just get back the sentiment and uh, results on that data using the web service. So we've got the Amazon Comprehend, Azure Text Analytics, IBM Watson, Preceive API, Sentiment32. You know, there's a bunch of them out there if, if that's what you need to do. So obviously, in this course, not expecting you to become PhDs in, to get PhDs in sentiment analysis in the next few weeks, right? So we're going to be using a web service um, to do the sentiment analysis for you. So at Amazon, for example, you've got a bunch of smart people, some of whom have PhDs in sentiment analysis, who are you know using deep neural networks and all that to train their system to do good sentiment analysis. So we'd be fools to do it ourselves. Um, the right approach is to use something like Amazon Comprehend to analyze our text. And that's what we're going to be doing. So um, I'll very quickly show you how easy it is um, to use Amazon Comprehend to analyze text for sentiment analysis. So it's a natural language processing service, um, uses machine learning to find insights, relationships, and texts, same as all the other ones out there. So we've got key phrases, sentiment analysis, syntax analysis, entity recognition, topic modeling. It's, uh, I haven't tested it remotely carefully, but my hunch is that it's probably okay. The sentiment analysis is mostly seems all right, um, but probably some of the deeper natural language understanding stuff's you know, not that great, I'm guessing, as most of these things aren't. I was deeply disappointed with Watson when I chucked some stuff in uh, on a was supervising another project on this and it was like man you know surely it could do better these days i was like oh, you know but anyway uh, so i suspect amazon comprehends the same if you put something in it's not necessarily going to pick out the right subject and it's probably far from perfect but it's probably a lot better than you could just do by yourself yeah so very just very quickly go through the very simple example code that you need so we've got uh at the top we've got you know the usual aws sdk and then to test this thing, I wrote one set of positive text, you know, the sentiments most of you are feeling at the moment, like CSD3205 is a great course, I really love it, it's fantastic. And then also I put in negative text, CSD3205 is awful, I really hate it, blah, blah, blah. And then we build, uh, as a DynamoDB is with most of these things, we have some parameters for the call to the, to the web service. In this case, we've got the language code, um, probably better stick to a single language when you're getting Twitter data and a single language for the sentiment analysis. You can use Comprehend to detect language, 
Um, but you know, you make life easier. It's a single language. It doesn't have to be English. You know, if you're a native speaker of Spanish or French or something, then that's fine too. I don't mind. Um, and obviously, we supply the text that we want to analyze as one of the arguments and the parameters too. There's probably some limits on that, but it's quite big. And then we create the instance of Comprehend that will do the, the uh, sentiment analysis for us. And then, um, as I'll explain in the next section, um, we need to think, start moving into the sort of space of Lambda functions running in the cloud to do all this. So what we're going to be doing is creating a, a handler, and we're going to be running this, this bit of code that I'm showing you here as a Lambda function in the cloud to do the sentiment analysis for us. Because, you know, the only local processing of data is going to be downloading data from the web service and uploading it to the cloud. After that, as I'll explain in the next section, the Lambda function is going to take over, and you're going to chain them together to do the processing for you. So we're going to have a handler, because it's been running a Lambda function in the cloud. And then we've got a very simple call to the detect sentiment uh, method with the parameters, callback function, uh, sorry, yeah, callback function. Um, and then, you know, we can here we're just out, out, outputting the results. Um, when you write your own code for this, you're obviously going to be saving that data to another DynamoDB table that contains the sentiment data. So if we put in some positive text to uh, AWS Comprehend, then we're getting uh, this kind of result where it's, you know, 98% positive because it's a great course, blah, 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 blah. So it's done a pretty good job on this very easy sentence. Um, and then if we look at, you know, CFD, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, a simple keyword count would do the job here. Um, and it's giving a you know, negative sentiment um, associated with this sentence. So in the very basic example with no metaphor and no, no complexity, um, AWS Comprehend's doing a nice job. Okay, so let's have a little demo of that. Um, let's go to, see if we've got a time on workbench. Uh, no, I haven't. So let's, uh, let's just refresh that. Okay, let's set everything up. So let's get this console open. Okay, so let's go to Lambda. So I've got that code that I just showed you, I've uploaded already um, to my Comprehend demo. It's also available uh, in the resources section of this uh, this week's lectures. So here we have it. Um, so let's uh, so let's start with positive text, All right? So got positive text there. Um, so that's this text here, right? I love great. It's a great course. Really love it, etc. Et so we create the code, save it. And I'm just going to test it within the Lambda console here. Um, rather than trying to connect it to a uh, you know a API gateway or anything like that, um, just because you know I'm just chucking some random parameters at it because I'm not, I'm not using the event here. So click test, right? It'll call comprehend um, and then outputs the results to the logs. So these logs are kind of okay, um, but as I've explained to you before, you can't really work very effectively. We can't work at all within the cloud without looking at the cloud logs. So we can look at the cloud logs instead because it lays things out a bit better as well. So here it's like 4.11, so that's probably us here. So here's the logs, and then we've got this successful call to comprehend, and then you can see here it's this positive, 98, you know, positive. And then if we change it back to negative text, which of course none of you are feeling here, um, then, we, uh, and then we save it, and then we test it again. Um, okay, and then that's negative on the log here. And we go back here, we've created a new version, right? So this is new set of logs for 16.12. And then here we go, sentiment score negative with 96%, you know, negative confidence, whatever it is, yeah? So, so here, I'm just logging it out to the console, yeah? But in your, as I explain in the next section, um, this code, you know, when you hook it up properly, will be saving the sentiment to some kind of a new, new DynamoDB table called sentiment data or something like that. Um, and then you'll be triggering this function um, from DynamoDB, right? So whenever, um, so I'm not going to configure it all now, but we could set up a thing so that we had a Twitter table, for example, here, um, that would then trigger this, this comprehend thing here, okay? It would pass in with the event, um, the new tweets, and then this thing here, the code here, would then, um, would then save um, the, the sentiment associated with the new tweets, um, back into the new database, and that's what I'm going to be covering in the next section. Okay, and obviously we've got 10 marks for doing that course of two, so it's a bit of a gift, right? Because after all, it's you know that much code. Uh, it won't take you long, um, but I think it's an important part of modern websites and modern ways of doing things, particularly when we get into the kind of data processing workflow stuff. So, you know, I'll, I'll give you 10 marks for that. Okay. 
so data processing workshop flows. So in the last lecture, um, I showed you how we can build this event-driven JavaScript application in the cloud using this Lambda technology, where we have triggers that generate events, which then call functions, and these functions then can do other stuff that write to other databases or other database tables and trigger new events and so on and so forth. Yeah. So. Um, but to make all that clear, I thought it was well worth explaining um, this, you know, one way in which you can hook all the Lambda functions together in your coursework to actually do the data processing for it, yeah? So I'm going to show you um, one way in which you can do the data processing workflows for sentiment and numerical data. If you can think of, this may not apply to your particular kind of projects, but I'm expecting some, something along these lines uh, for coursework too, okay? And that's why I'm, I'm, you know, devoting some time to explaining exactly what I'm expecting here, yeah? Let's switch the light. Dark in it. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Right. So the WebSocket stuff uh, is all coming in the next lecture. But so just sort of take it as uh, you know how it's going to be, and you'll understand how to make it um, when I when when you watch the next lecture. So we're starting off with the WebSocket. So this is the first time that the client comes to your website, right? They kind of so they make a WebSocket connect request um, to the Amazon API gateway here. The API gateway will then pass, will generate an event containing the connection ID and pass it to onConnect here. So sorry, I should explain. So the uh, bluish stuff are DynamoDB tables. The pinky orangey stuff is, uh, orangey I guess, Amazon Web Service, and green is a Lambda function. So here we have a client connecting to a service here, Amazon service, the API gateway, passing the connection ID via an event and calling a Lambda function with that connection ID here. So, as I'll explain next week, you have to use a DynamoDB table to keep all the connection IDs um, for the WebSocket functionality. So, we're going to say so this function here will store that connection ID in the WebSocket client's DynamoDB table. Then, because this is the first time the client's connected, um, it's going to call get the last. So, this is sentiment processing, data processing workflow, yeah? So, it's going to get the last sentiment, last hundred, let's say, can be whatever you like. Uh, data points of sentiment analysis, all that positive, negative, ne neutral stuff. It's going to do a you know, scan or whatever it is on the sentiment data. Um, and it's going to pass those sentiment data points back through the API gateway and back through the client, back to the client via WebSocket message. So what the client will see, it'll make a WebSocket connection. And then the first message it'll get back will be the, you know, the, the last most recent hundred data points which you can then use to uh, draw its graph to of sentiment you know the sentiment changes over time or whatever method you use to visualize uh, the sentiment data numerical data works in the same way we make a the client make a WebSocket connection request through the api gateway maybe this will call the same function could be a different one you could have different web services uh different um uh, sorry different web socket apis um for the numerical and sentiment data so how you do it is kind of up to you um, so we're going to go through the, but anyway, let's suppose it's the same method, gets called the onConnect method, um, and then passes, stores the connection ID, of course, and then it, in this case, it's getting the last 100 data points of the historical and predicted data from the currency data. Actually, I should have shown you the, there's a predicted data table here, which is missing. But anyway, so we're getting the historical and predicted data from DynamoDB, um, and that's going back to the API gateway here um, and being passed back to the client. So again, from a client perspective, um, they're making the first call to the to the API gateway, and they're getting back um, the last the last hundred data points of the historical record and whatever predicted data points they got as well. Yeah. So I said this is missing a table, but you know it's it's not a big deal. Yeah. So that's the interact first set of interactions um, when the client first connects. Yeah. This is the first connection of the client um, to the server to get the numerical data, and that will enable the client to load up graphs of what's currently in the database. But the whole key to this is the fact that uh, the data is changing over time, right? You don't want the client to just see the last 100 data points and then sit there pressing F5 to refresh it. The whole point of WebSockets is that the server can push new data to the client as it as and when it comes along, yeah? That's the whole dashboard functionality that CryptoWatch you know, does so elegantly, yeah? So this is the kind of workflow you need to set up um, to hoover up new data, put that in the cloud, and then respond to uh, changes. Uh, and then when the new data has been processed in the cloud, it can then push it back to the client. That's what this is all about. So here we've got the TypeScript code. So this is a slightly artificial example um, because 
Um, I think it's well worth learning TypeScript, but it makes most sense learning TypeScript within the local environment before you mess around, um, you know, trying to, you know, deploy, transpile TypeScript into the cloud. Yeah, so in a real example, this TypeScript code would be running as a Lambda function. It wouldn't be running as a, um, as a, as a local function running on your, on your PC or whatever, yeah? But in this slightly artificial example, this is how it's working. So we've got your TypeScript code running locally, pulling a bunch of tweets from Twitter. Then what's going to happen with this code is it's going to save it. To... Okay, well, apologies for the interruption. Yeah, I just had a delivery come, so I'm not going to start this recording from the beginning, but so I'll just resume where I, uh, where I was. So sentiment data processing, yeah, so we've got the local, local code um, running here, downloading the uh, tweets from Twitter. Then that's going to store that, those uh, tweets uh, within a Twitter data table in DynamoDB. As I said, this should really be a Lambda function in real life. Um, and you can set Lambda functions to execute every day or every week or however often you need to do it. Um, but in this example, because I want you to learn TypeScript, we're working local code. So it stores the data in uh, DynamoDB. Now what I explained in the lecture on Lambda functions is that we can set up triggers. And I just mentioned that when I did the little demo there, right? So we can set a trigger so that whenever we get new data coming in here, um, it'll generate an event and call a Lambda function and pass the new tweets as, an event, as part of the event into get sentiment here. So when a new tweet goes in here, it will call the get sentiment Lambda function. That can do exactly what I covered in this lecture. It can call comprehend and it'll get back uh, the sentiment data. It can then store that sentiment data in a separate table. I recommend you use a separate table um, just because it makes more sense. It's easier to access the different bits of data and you can handle the triggers better. So it gets the sentiment data and stores it in a sentiment data table, let's say. That can be associated with another trigger. So we're using these triggers to hook up these Lambda functions as part of our data processing workflow. So this trigger in sentiment data will call the sentiment update function. Now you remember we had the connection IDs, um, have them all stored in the WebSocket clients table. So the sentiment update will pull the, the IDs of the connected clients. It will also pull the last uh, 100 sentiment data points, let's say and then it will send a WebSocket message to the client with the latest data points uh, inside it. Yeah? So it's a, I think it's a rather nice uh, way in which you can build up these uh, data processing workflows. So we're getting the new data coming in, we're processing that data to get some sentiment data out of it, and then we're triggering an update so that we're pushing the new information back to the client. Yeah? And you can do this, this is a very unsophisticated way of doing it, right? We're just saying, here's the new 100 data points. Obviously, we're trying to be super efficient. We could just send the latest data points at the end of the graph, but then we'd have to know where each of the clients are, and that gets messy. So the easiest way is just to send the last 100 data points so they can just redraw the graph with that new data. And we're not talking a huge amount of stuff to send over the network, so I'm, I'm not worried about that, really. Okay, so that's the something like the kind of sentiment data processing architecture that you should be using, yeah? And we got exactly the same thing with uh, numerical data processing. So again, we got this slightly unrealistic local TypeScript code being transpiled and all that, but we're, gonna, we're sticking with that, yeah? But so we're gonna download the exchange rates. I'll show you how to do that with Fixer.io. Um, gonna store the exchange rates in our currency data table, for example. That will cause a trigger, and call, which will call this function here, uh, get predictions, and the trigger will contain that the event for that trigger will contain the new exchange rates. And our get predictions thing here, we'll call AWS forecast, which will return the predicted, uh, predicted exchange rates. So this part of the architecture is highly likely to change, okay? This was the idea I had when I first put together the coursework, but forecast is still in beta or pre-release pre mode or something like that. So we can't currently use forecast for this. So we might have to use an Azure web service or we might have to do something different, but the the general, you know, what, what will happen here will be the same. It just might be a slightly different way in which we actually get generate the different predictions, yeah? Then we got the predicted exchange rates from this forecast web service or whatever we happen to do. And we store those in our predicted currency data, DynamoDB table. Again, I recommend you use a different one here from here because then we can handle the triggers much better. Um, because it's going to be a mess, right? If we write this back to currency data and then we're going to get generate two sets of triggers. So you really want a separate table here. Um, so we write the predicted exchange rates down to here, and that will generate another trigger, um, this currency update, um, currency update um, lambda function. And then that needs three things, right? It needs the IDs of the connected, so uh, connected, connected clients. 
it needed, needs the predicted currency data and it needs the historical data. And then it will take all of that data, use the IDs, uh, in fact, I've got a slight mistake here, so again, this should, this should be pushing it back through the API gateway. So this should actually look like uh, this, right? So when it gets the new data, it, it'll push it back through the API gateway and back to the client, yeah? But, you know, uh, as I said, it's only a, a, an approximate architecture here. It does go to the client, but just via the API gateway. So when this currency update is triggered, it gets the IDs, because it needs those IDs to send it to the client. It gets the last 100 bits of historical data, the, the whatever, 50, 100, whatever predicted rates, and sends the whole thing back um, using a WebSocket message back to the client here. So it's just a rough idea of how you could do it, but this kind of way of doing things is the right way to do things and the way I'm expecting you to do it in, in your projects, yeah? So it's just examples of data processing workflows that you can use. Feel free to come up with your own designs. I recommend if you're doing something radically different um, that you have a discussion with me about it in the lab, so I might be able to give some suggestions. Um, and coursework 2, as you probably know, has marks for using some kind of data processing workflow in the cloud. So, you know, you should be, it's a nice way to do things and you should be doing some stuff with the with this functionality, yeah? So in terms of the serverless marks, I mean, they're slightly skewed, but I'm not gonna change them now. Um, so if you get a get the serverless stuff working, which you're gonna have to to get the web sockets working, you're gonna have to, to do the data processing workflows. So there's roughly 15 marks uh, for this, with the explicit marks, um, for this kind of hooking things together with triggers to do the data processing workflow for, um, uh, with the Lambda functions. Okay, so as usual, got a bunch of resources um, and the very simple sentiment analysis code is there for you as well. Um, and all this should be, uh, uh, should be week 19, a couple of minor mistakes, nothing, nothing to worry about. Okay, so in this lecture, I've introduced you to sentiment analysis and explained how you can use AWS Comprehend to analyze text for sentiment. I also hope I've shown you how important and useful sentiment analysis is. And I've, in the last part of this talk, I showed you how you could use this event-driven Lambda architecture to process your data in the cloud. And the next lecture is gonna be on uh, WebSockets.